All right, everyone, welcome back to the land of Kel. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone, welcome back. This is episode 23, the function of Newgrange and the passage chamber structures of Ireland. I am very excited to finally be releasing tonight's episode. So in the final chapter of the land of Kem, a quarry returns home from Egypt to Ireland and applies the knowledge that he gained through the degrees of the Egyptian pyramids to interpreting the long lost function of the passage chamber structures of Ireland. And in my opinion, the final chapter of the book contains some of the most compelling research that I have produced regarding the capability of these ancient structures to produce chemicals. So just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. If you like these videos, leave it a like. If you haven't already, please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification bell so that you get noticed whenever these videos premiere. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, please leave it in the comment section below. And if you have any suggestions for future videos, I'm also taking that into consideration for any topics that you'd like to hear me discuss. I think that is it for the intro. I'm super excited to finally be getting this material out to you guys, and I really hope you enjoy. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we go with tonight's episode. We are going to start with a review of my 2018 research expedition to Ireland. So after my first trip to Egypt in 2017, I returned home to the U.S. and began researching these structures as related to the science of ancient chemical engineering. And I knew that there was a connection between the Egyptian pyramids and the ancient passage chamber structures of Ireland. However, I had never been to Ireland myself, and I knew that to fully evaluate these structures, I had to see them for myself in person. That is exactly what I did in 2018. So this is a picture of me standing out in front of Newgrange, and here on the right, this is a picture of me inside the passage chamber structures of Carrowkeel. So the itinerary for this research trip, we started on the eastern coast of Ireland to see Newgrange, Noth, I apologize if I butcher the pronunciation, but Doth, Fornox, and Low Crew. I then took our rental car, drove, drove from the eastern coast of Ireland all the way to the western coast. It was an absolutely fantastic adventure, and we drove to the western coast of Ireland to see the passage chamber structures at Carrowkeel, which was an absolutely spectacular experience. I highly recommend visiting the Emerald Isle if you haven't been before, because these structures are as compelling to me as the Egyptian pyramids, and there's something very familiar about these sites. Having been in Egypt and experienced the energy around the Egyptian pyramids, when I got to Ireland, I felt the exact same I can't even describe it, but there's a certain energy around these structures that was very similar to what I experienced in Egypt. And again, I knew there was a connection between these structures, but until I got a chance to go inside them and research them for myself, I couldn't quite put all of the pieces together. And putting all of those pieces together was exactly the intention of this research trip. So this next slide just shows the configuration of Newgrange, and it's a very, very straightforward structure. You see the passage, leading in from the exterior of the structure. Inside of the monument itself, there are three individual chambers that flank a central vaulted chamber. You can see here the large vault on this central chamber, and each of these side chambers contains a granite bowl. And I'm gonna show some pictures of those here in just a moment. All right, on the outside of the Newgrange Monument, you see here the curbstone of Newgrange, and we're going to be discussing the symbols on this curbstone coming up here later in the video, because this, ladies and gentlemen, is literally an instruction manual for exactly how this structure operated. This is the opening that you currently use to go into the structure, and this here is an air intake. And the first time that I saw this air intake, it immediately reminded me of the air shafts of the Egyptian pyramids. And you can see here that this little opening is located above the lintel stone that separates the opening to the monument and this air intake. And we're going to discuss the fu function of this little component here coming up towards the end of the video. And the next couple of pictures are going to show the inside of the passage chamber itself. And these are the red granite collection bowls. Yes, I did say red granite, a very similar connection to what we see in some of the structures in Egypt. And these are the bowls that are placed in those three ancillary chambers. Now, a couple of these pictures did come from Wikipedia. Unfortunately, 
they do not allow tourists to take pictures inside of these monuments. They rush you in, rush you out. They give you about five minutes inside the structure. And I got a lot of shit from the guy at the entrance because I was actually trying to research and document what I was finding inside of this structure. They wanted absolutely no part of that. So I was rushed in, rushed out, and wasn't able to take any pictures of my own. All of the other pictures in this presentation are from my research trip. But again, these pictures from the inside are taken from Wikipedia. Again, these ones just show the red granite bowls that are inside of these chambers. This is a close-up of one of those red granite bowls. We're going to discuss their function in a minute. All right, so this is a picture showing the monuments at Noth, another very, very unusual site that is located in very close proximity to Newgrange. It's about a 10-minute, 15-minute drive away, and you can see here that there are numerous passage chamber structures sprinkled all around this very, very unusual site. These are some pictures that I took for my research. So you see that there is a stairway leading up to a platform on the top of this massive mound. And the next picture is actually taken from the top of this, looking in the opposite direction at the absolutely beautiful Irish countryside. The vibrant green of the terrain in Ireland is completely unbelievable. It is unlike anything that I've ever seen. And if I remember correctly, this mound here in the distance is Newgrange. So you can see one monument from the other, very similar to the visual connection on the landscape that we see with the Egyptian pyramids. And the next couple of pictures are just showing my personal research photos from the Noth site. Again, there's a series of these passage chamber structures kind of scattered all throughout this site. And there are some other very unusual structures all throughout this particular location. Very, very unusual site indeed. This is one of the passages leading into the central chamber at Noth. And this is actually a picture from Carrowkeel. So like I said before, we drove from the eastern coast of Ireland all the way to the western coast. And one of the things about touring the monuments of Ireland, there are no tour guides, there are no groups, there are no ticket booths or anything like that. You simply drive up to these monuments, you go on a huge hike to the top of the hill, and you find exactly what you were looking for. So the process to get up to Carrowkeel, I had some inkling of what it was going to be like hiking up to the top of this mountain, but I had no idea how long it was going to take or how difficult of a hike it turned out to be. So you drive your car up here, you park it and walk all the way up this road to the top of this central hill. Then you walk over and you're hiking, hiking, hiking up the side of this hill all the way to the monuments on the top. And it was an absolutely exhausting hike to get up to the top. But what we found at the top was 100% worth it. And this is an aerial photo showing the passage chamber mounds at the top of that hill that I showed in the previous slide. And there are three large passage chambers here on this side of the monument. And on the other side of the hill, there's a huge passage chamber here called Queen Maeve's Carn. Unfortunately, this one is currently closed to the public and we didn't get a chance to go up there, but we did tour all three of these here on the left side of this massive hill. Again, that aerial view showing those passage chamber structures. It was a really incredible experience to be on the top of this hill. And while I was inside of these passage chamber structures, I happened to find this very unusual stone in the back of one of the ancillary chambers. And of course, you can see exactly what is depicted here, a massive triangle that certainly looks like one of the Egyptian pyramids. And I'm going to show a video of what it's like to be inside of these structures here in just a sec. All right, the next couple of slides are going to be a preview of a very important topic that is coming up soon here in the discussion on the Land of Chem YouTube channel. Now, these images are from a book called Pie in the Sky by a gentleman named Michael Poinder. And while I disagree with several of the conclusions that he has reached in that book, I really like his work on the configuration and the alignment of these structures in relation to Earth's electromagnetic grid field pattern. And you can see here on this slide the location of several of the monuments that I described in my recap of my 2018 research expedition to Ireland, which are Newgrange here in the center. This is Noth, 
that complex of several stone and earth works. This is Doth, another very unusual location that I was fortunate enough to visit, and these are all located along the River Boyne. Now again, Michael Poinder is researching the location of these structures in relation to Earth's electromagnetic grid pattern. And this is one of those energy lines that moves across Ireland. So very, very interesting stuff. Now, you may remember the experiment that I presented in my recaps of my most recent research expedition to Egypt that shows the properties of the limestone used in the construction of the pyramids in relation to the electromagnetic energy field that is being produced by that machine. And I may go ahead and throw in a, another teaser of that video coming up here after these slides. But you can see here another very prominent energy line that runs across Ireland, and all of these monuments are located on this energy line, which is Noth, Newgrange, etc. are here. The Hill of Tara is here. Low Crew is here. Caro Keel, Caro Moor, Knock Nerea, several of the other very prominent passage chamber sites of Ireland, again, all located along this energy line. And it is very interesting when you start to analyze this configuration in relation to the monuments at Giza. So again, this is an extrapolation pulling back from the island of Ireland. And he proposes that this great circle of energy with its center at Queen's, Queen Maeve's Carn on Knock Nerea. Again, Knock Nerea is that huge hill to the right side of Carrowkeel that I showed in the previous slides about, again, my 2018 research expedition to Ireland. It's that big monument on the right side on that huge hill. And you can see here that there is a configuration between Knock Nerea, Stonehenge, and this line continues all the way to the Great Pyramid of Giza. So there is a very, very interesting connection about these structures and their location on the globe. And okay, again, we have the device that was built by our friend uh, John D. Riley, uh, the one that produces an electromagnetic charge or field. And it's now on, as you can hear it. And you can see that there are no charges coming out of it because this is plastic over here. And just a note about the function of the machine. So this transforms alternating current into direct current, which produces, like Yusuf said, an electromagnetic field around the machine. And when you're standing close to this, or put your hand in proximity of the surface, you can feel that electromagnetic field here very, very easily. And it'll continue to build the longer we keep this machine on. And for any of you that are interested, this is called the Lifestream Field Generator, and you can go to zeropointresearch.com. Again, Yusuf and I don't have any affiliation with the machine, but we are gonna use this to demonstrate some of the properties of the geology that can be found in the constructions in Egypt. So we're gonna be taking a look at several different types of stone today. We have samples of limestone, we have samples of black basalt, we have samples of red granite, and we have samples of white calcite. And we're just gonna make a couple of quick videos, again, demonstrating the properties of these stones in proximity to this electromagnetic energy field. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we are with our good friend Yusuf Awion at the Kemet shop today. Again, we're demonstrating the properties of some of the geology utilized in the construction of the Egyptian pyramids in proximity to the electromagnetic field being produced by this machine. And this is just a quick video to demonstrate the properties of the limestone. Again, you can see and hear the discharge. And the reason this is occurring is because limestone does not provide any electromagnetic impedance. The electromagnetic energy is flowing directly through the limestone and producing a discharge into the copper wire. Now, before I proceed with explaining exactly how these structures operated and how I reached that conclusion, I just wanted to provide some historical background about the civilization that is reported to have built these structures. Now, there is a group called the Tuadadanan, which is reported to be this mythological 
civilization that arrived in Ireland bringing technology, knowledge, science, and magic. And we know from our discussions that the magic of these ancient civilizations was indeed a practical knowledge of chemistry. And you can see here that the Tua de Danann are associated with all of these sites in Ireland. So the Hill of Tara, for example, is one of Ireland's most sacred ancient sites, a very unusual site. Although it's being commonly associated with the Celts, this site predates their arrival in Ireland by thousands of years. So they don't know exactly who built these structures. However, the mythology of Ireland tells us exactly who built these things, and it was this Tua de Danann group. Now, you may also be saying that there is absolutely no connection whatsoever between Egypt and Ireland. Well, according to the mythology of the Emerald Isle, there most certainly is a connection, and you can see that in the legend of Queen Scotia which was an Egyptian prince or princess that is said to have arrived in Ireland, and she was inevitably killed in battle by the Tua de Don. And again, this mythological group of settlers that arrived into Ireland with all of this knowledge and science, magic, including chemistry. And you can see here that Scotia's grave, this is just another interesting aside that leads me into another topic that I'm going to be discussing very soon, which is the island of Skellig Michael, because there's some very interesting operations that were occurring on this small island. But nonetheless, it is reported that in 1400 BC, a magical storm caused by the Tua de Danann submerged one of these ships. So all of these myths of these ancient fogs and these ancient weapons that were utilized by these civilizations, very, very intriguing when you reinterpret those stories from the perspective of chemistry. And I have this exact topic scheduled for a video coming up soon, which is the connection between ancient magic and the science of chemistry. And this is just a quick photo of the island of Skellig Michael. This is a very perplexing and mysterious little island, and I will be covering this coming up soon because there are some very interesting structures located at the top of this island. And this is just a preview of that video that I just mentioned in regard to the mythological weapons of the Tua de Danann and the connection between ancient magic and chemistry. And I just wanted to point one thing out, that according to Irish mythology, there's this book called the Labor Gabala Iran, which is the book of invasions that details the series of different civilizations that arrived into and inhabited Ireland. And there were all these battles between these different civilizations. And it's a very, very complicated text, which has been incorporated as Irish mythology. However, we know that there is a lot of truth and knowledge in these ancient myths that is more accurately probably the history of that little island. So again, the Dagda is one of the important guard gods of Irish mythology. He is one of the Tua de Danann with all of this magical power. And according to the legends of Ireland and the Labor Gabala Iran, he is said to dwell in the Bruna Boyne, which is actually Newgrange. So according to the Irish mythology, Newgrange is absolutely not a burial site, but is, is the dwelling place of this mythological god of the Tua de Danann. So it's very, very interesting that they have incorporated this site into the mythology, and it is directly associated with this magical, i.e. possessing the knowledge of chemistry, civilization. All right, and here on this slide, this is one of my favorite little diagrams that depicts the configuration of Newgrange. And I just wanted to preview this for you so that you can keep this in mind as we begin to discuss the symbols of the Newgrange curbstone. So when I was inside of the monuments at the top of Carrowkeel, it was a beautiful day when we were hiking up the mountain. We got up there, I spent about probably an hour and a half exploring all of the monuments at the top of the hill. And all of a sudden I was inside one of these passage chamber structures and I heard this enormous boom of rolling thunder. And all of a sudden I could hear this rainfall, just torrential downpour from outside of the structure. And my travel companion that was with me at the time, she and I were inside of this structure and we started to notice that the rainfall was accumulating and starting to run into the structure. So the structure itself was beginning to fill with water. We also noticed that when the wind was blowing in the right direction, the structure, the passageway leading into the structure was actually designed to funnel air inside of these chambers. And there was circulating air inside of these little stone passage chamber systems. And again, I showed you that air intake that is located here on the exterior of Newgrange, and that is exactly the intention of this component of the structure, which is to funnel air 
into the inner chambers and there is circulating moist airflow inside of these chambers. And we'll get to that here in just a moment. All right, so this is the curb stone of Newgrange. And so at the time when I saw this thing, when I went to Ireland, I didn't know how these structures operated. All I had was an inkling that there was a connection between the passage chamber monuments of Ireland and the Egyptian pyramids. So I went there, all I wanted to do was see these things in person, to experience them and I was hoping that the monuments would speak to me and give me some direction in terms of how they originally operated and I certainly got that in my experience exploring the monuments of Karakil and again that torrential downpour that eventually began to flood these chambers and I didn't realize it at that time but I had discovered the methodology that was involved in the operation of these structures and it wasn't until several months after I arrived home after that trip that I finally realized exactly what this stone was depicting. And I think I mentioned this at the beginning of the video. This is literally an instruction manual for exactly how this structure operated, and it is located directly in front of the opening. Now you see here a very peculiar series of symbols. So let's analyze these individually, and then we can proceed with explaining exactly what each of these things mean. So here at the bottom of the stone, this is a series of undulating lines, very wavy lines that cover the bottom of the stone. So this is symbol number one. Here on the right, you see this square or diamond shaped symbol that is repeated heading in this direction to the right of the stone. You see here these spirals which are moving in this direction. And you see here there is a triple spiral configuration. So there is this circulation of air. And I already kind of spoiled the secret of what, what these symbols actually mean. So again, there's circulating air depicted here in this triple spiral symbol. And again, remember that because it will be applicable to the configuration of these chambers. There's three spirals here. And if you recall from the beginning of the video, all of these monuments have three ancillary chambers that flank the large central chamber. And you can also see here, that there are three more of those square or diamond symbols at the left side of this stone. So this is a quote from the final chapter of the Land of Chem, and it describes perfectly my sentiment when I discovered exactly what this stone was communicating. So to the uninitiated, these strange carvings would have appeared to be primitive art or magic symbols, but a quarry now knew that the magic of the Order of Chem was chemistry. He had seen similar glyphs before during his apprenticeship and understood them to be representations of chemical compounds. And I think you can see what direction we are heading because ladies and gentlemen, this is a rudimentary depiction of a chemical reaction sequence that was occurring inside of this structure. So as I mentioned before, when I was inside of the passage chamber monuments of Karakil, that rainwater began rushing into the passage chamber and there was air blowing into the system and circulating inside of the central chamber. At that point, I'd, I was beginning to realize the methodology of operation that was involved in the structure. However, I had no idea what the actual reactants or product of that system were. And again, it wasn't until several months after I returned that I stumbled across a miraculous revelation in my research that led me to begin investigating green vitriol, otherwise known as ferrous sulfate. And ferrous sulfate was one of the most ubiquitously useful chemicals in the ancient world. This thing could be used to produce a multitude of different compounds that have all sorts of different applications. So a very, very valuable chemical. And the study of vitriol actually began in the ancient times, even according to the conventional archaeological and historical record. The Sumerians had lists of different types of vitriol that they were using and producing for all sorts of different applications. So again, the study of green vitriol, i.e. ferrous sulfate, goes back all the way to the Sumerians circa 3000 BC. Now, of course, I believe that the story of these ancient structures goes back much further than that, and that ancient story has been compressed to fit the conventional Judeo-Christian timeline of everything begins at 3500 BC 
that is the start date of human civilization, and there is no sophisticated civilizations that became before that. They were all Neolithic hunter-gatherers. Okay, that's fine. But again, the mythology of these ancient civilizations say that these structures and the civilizations themselves have existed long before. Now, just another note about the green vitriol or ferrous sulfate. This compound can also be used to produce sulfuric acid. So again, it's a very, very useful chemical that has many, many applications, and it is a chemical reactant that can also be used to produce all sorts of different compounds. So there is certainly a reason that would justify the construction of these structures if a chemical like this was such a, a benefit to the civilization at large. So I started researching the industrial production of ferrous sulfate or green vitriol, and I stumbled across a small video that showed me exactly how these structures were operated. So the universe works in very mysterious ways, and all of the revelations that I've come to in regard to my research were not ideas that I per se came up with, but I happened to stumble across these things in my process of research, and it was literally like a light being turned on. And I finally, you know, the proverbial angel singing, ah, uh, one of those type of discoveries. And it was really quite miraculous that I happened to stumble across this video. So again, let's go through the chemical reaction that we are describing inside of these structures. And then I will show you exactly how this chemical reaction is connected to the symbols on the curbstone. It's awesome. This is one of my favorite parts of the theory and of the book. So, ferrous sulfate is prepared industrially by the oxidation of marcasite, i.e. iron disulfide. And you see here this in the chemical reaction sequence. This is known as marcasite, which is its um, mineral name. So, the marcasite is pulverized and placed into basins. And you may remember from our previous slides, the basins that are located inside of these structures. So keep these little basins in mind because they are going to be applicable in my interpretation of the symbols of the curbstone. And just a side note, these structures are all made of limestone. And these basins and the stones beneath them are made of red granite. So you may recognize both of those building materials from the Egyptian pyramids and the civilization that built these structures has also utilized them in the construction of these monuments. All right, so the next step in the process, this marcasite is stacked in heaps and exposed to moist air for several days and then leached with water. So you see here in the chemical reaction sequence, your iron disulfite reacts with oxygen and water to create ferrous sulfate with a byproduct of sulfuric acid. So again, this is a very interesting reaction when you consider the ubiquitous usefulness of these chemicals to an ancient civilization. So this is just a depiction of the product that has been created by this reaction sequence. So I'll review this one more time before I explain exactly how the curbstone is communicating this reaction. So you see here the iron disulfide is pulverized and stacked into heaps. These heats these heaps are slowly oxidized by moist airflow. You see here represented by the oxygen and the water, which yields ferrous sulfate and a byproduct of sulfuric acid. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is exactly what is being depicted on the curbstone of Newgrange. So you see here, again, those undulating lines at the bottom of the stone. These depict water that is flowing into the passage chamber system. This is exactly what I experienced when I was on top of the hill at Carrowkeel and that rainwater began rushing into the passage chamber system. So you see here at the back of the stone, these are the three basins that are depicted in those ancillary chambers that flank the central chamber and the marcasite was stacked into these basins. So the water is flowing into the chamber. There is air moving into the chamber through that air intake. And all of these structures are designed to conduct moving air into the passage chamber system. And that moving air is circulated around that triple chamber system. And you can see here that is exactly what is depicted on the curbstone of Newgrange is the air circulating around that triple chamber system. Again, depicted here on the stone with this triple spiral symbol. So again, the air is moving into the chamber, the air is circulating around the triple chamber system. You have your marcasite, which is stacked into heaps here in these little basins. 
they this is being transformed by this moist airflow so this air is picking up moisture from the water that is flowing into the chamber that moist airflow circulating in the chamber is oxidizing the iron disulfide that is stacked into heaps in these basins transforming it into ferrous sulfate which is the crystals that are depicted here coming out of the structure as your product and this is just another recreation of that depiction so that you can visualize the chemical reaction that is being depicted on this stone. Again, this is a rudimentary chemical equation, a literal instruction manual for how this structure operated, and it is located directly in front of this monument. It is perplexing to me that no one has ever interpreted these symbols. Um, even when we went to visit the monument, the tour guys at the site said that there's never been an interpretation of these symbols other than the fact that they are magic symbols or just art or some sort of decor decoration of the monument itself. But when you look at these symbols from the perspective of chemistry and these being some sort of alchemical symbols from an ancient civilization that was attempted to communicate how this structure operated so that future generations could come along and retrieve that knowledge, it becomes a very, very interesting stone indeed. And again, it's sitting right out in front of the opening to this monument. So you can see here on the left, Again, this is the marcasite that is stacked into the heaps in those basins. This triple spiral symbol is symbolizing the moist airflow circulating in that triple chamber system. Remember that Newgrange has those three flanking chambers that flank the large central vaulted chamber. And that central vaulted chamber itself is designed to promote that circulating airflow throughout the chamber. So if we go back here to one of these previous slides, let's see if I have this in here. All right, here we go. So again, the water is going to fill this chamber flowing in here. The air is going to be rushing in through this air intake and this vaulted central chamber is designed to produce that circulating moist airflow throughout the chamber that will gradually oxidize that iron disulfide, transforming it into ferrous sulfate. So here are those same symbols applied to a diagram of Newgrange to help you further visualize the chemical reaction that was occurring inside of the structure and how it might have actually looked while it was in operation. So you can see here the water flowing into the chamber depicted by these undulating lines at the bottom of the stone. The air is going to be rushing in through that air intake and circulating in through this large vaulted chamber around the three smaller chambers that flank the central chamber depicted here by that triple spiral symbol. You can see here your product being created in the three basins in those smaller flanking chambers. This is iron disulfide being transformed into crystalline green vitriol, which you see here being extracted from the structure depicted by these little crystals here on the right side of the stone. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is my interpretation of the symbols of the Newgrange curbstone and how they are communicating exactly how this monument would have operated. Again, a very rudimentary chemical equation showing future generations exactly what this monument was used for. Now, you may be asking yourself, what exactly were they doing with this ferrous sulfate that was extracted from these chamber systems? So during my 2018 research expedition to Ireland, I was exploring all of the passage chamber structures. And while I was doing that, I was also analyzing the terrain that surrounded these monuments. And I noticed that all of these structures are built on top of a hill. And at the bottom of the hill, there is a bog area, this kind of marshy wetland area that surrounds the hill. So I just kind of kept that in mind. So we continued with the research expedition, traveled from the eastern coast of Ireland all the way to the western coast to Sligo to see the monuments of Carrowkeel. And while we're at the top of Carrowkeel, this torrential downpour is coming down and it's pouring by the time we're leaving the hill. And we begin our hike down and I noticed that all of the groundwater that was accumulating at the top of the hill and pouring into the structures was also flowing down channels down the side of the hill into this bog area. And I just kind of noticed that kept it in my mind, and about three months after I got home, I stumbled across another revelation in my research, and I finally realized exactly what the original intention of these structures were. 
So there is a very interesting substance that is naturally produced inside of these bogs. It's called bog iron. And you can harvest this bog iron and produce metallic iron. Now this bog iron is created inside of these little marshy wetlands by groundwater that contains dissolved iron. Now ferrous sulfate is a water soluble compound and ferrous sulfate is actually incorporated into this groundwater that produces deposits of bog iron. Now again, the anaerobic bacteria inside of these bogs and the acidic nature of the bog transforms this ferrous sulfate into deposits of metallic iron oxide. That metallic iron oxide can then be smelted to produce actual iron metal. Now this bog iron is a renewable resource and the same bog can be harvested about once each generation. So let's say for example, this ancient civilization had survived a massive cataclysm. They travel to their new home and they're going to build these structures that are going to increase their probability of survival and provide them with chemicals that are going to benefit their civilization as they reestablish their life in this new area. So again, that was the intention of these structures. The passage chamber structures of Ireland was to renew and increase the amount of ferrous sulfate that was being introduced into these bogs, which inevitably led to a significant increase in the amount of iron that could be harvested from these bogs. So by performing an annual ritual of creating ferrous sulfate inside of these passage chamber monuments, they were able to ensure that future generations would be able to harvest iron from that bog from forever. According to the conventional timeline, the passage chamber monuments of Ireland predate the construction of the Egyptian pyramids. And I use a similar timeline in my book. However, it's pushed back several thousand years. However, I do believe that the operation of these passage chamber monuments was eventually updated and improved. The bog transformation method became obsolete and they were harvesting this ferrous sulfate solution directly to produce more pure crystalline ferrous sulfate. They were also using that to produce iron, also using that to produce sulf sulfuric acid. So the ferrous sulfate, the iron that can be rendered from it, and the variety of chemicals that can be produced from ferrous sulfate would certainly justify the massive construction effort that went into building these monuments in like manner as the Egyptian pyramids. These are massive infrastructure projects that were designed to benefit and support the growing agriculture and industry in these regions. So let's propose that the civilization that survived the cataclysm at the end of the last ice age survived and the refugees fled their destroyed homeland in search of a new home. And when they arrived, they already had knowledge. They had science, they had technology, they had knowledge of construction, geometry, architecture, physics and indeed chemistry which was interpreted as the uninitiated as magic of these ancient gods so they arrived to their new homes they employed their knowledge of construction and chemistry in building these structures which were going to produce chemicals that increased the probability of survival for their population in their new homes so this is the story and the timeline that i present in the land of chem book and it leads me to an upcoming video where i'm going to explain the entire timeline of the cataclysm of the building of these monuments that eventually led to the construction of the Egyptian pyramids in Egypt. So I'm also going to be circling back on these mythological gods, the Tua de Danan, this ancient legendary civilization that once inhabited Ireland, because there is a very, very interesting story to be told about this civilization. And there is a lot of research about who these individuals actually were. I'll get to that later. We're also going to be coming back and discussing the magic of these ancient civilizations reinterpreted from the perspective of chemistry. And this is where the ancient story of all of these myths from across the planet get very, very interesting. So I'm really, really excited to finally be getting to those. Just stay tuned. So don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, that one of the most critical applications for the ferrous sulfate is for the precipitation of gold that has been dissolved into a solution of aqua regia. So one of the most essential applications for all of the chemicals being produced inside of these ancient structures would have been metallurgy. Now, you also may be saying to yourself that this passage chamber heap leaching method doesn't appear to be the most effective way to produce chemicals. Well, it certainly isn't. Ladies and gentlemen, this is ancient chemistry, and it is miraculous what this civilization was able to accomplish simply by applying their ingenious knowledge of the science of chemistry. 
And just a quick reminder that limited first edition print copies of the Land of Chem book are now available at thelandofchem.com. So if you'd like to help support the channel, just go to the website. You can pick up a copy of the book, grab a t-shirt. Either way, all of the orders mean the world to me. So thank you all so much in advance. All right, everyone, I really hope you enjoyed today's video. This was episode 23, the function of New Grange and the passage chamber structures of Ireland. If you liked the video, definitely leave it a like. If you haven't already, please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification bell so that you get noticed whenever these videos premiere. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, please leave a comment below. I always try to check those and respond to everyone directly. I'm also entertaining suggestions for topics for future videos. So if there's anything that you'd like for me to cover or discuss, leave it in the comment section below and I will definitely take that into consideration. I have some really awesome videos coming up for the next several episodes in the series. I won't spoil the surprise, but I just want to say thank you to all of my supporters and subscribers. Uh, if you have Instagram, you can follow me on Instagram for daily posts, exclusive videos, all that kind of cool stuff. Uh, I think that's it for today's video. So I will see you next time.